after a process of restarting several projects. Eileen Hooper Greenhill and Jocelyn Dodd, professors from the Research Center for Museums and Galleries of the University of Leicester, developed the Generic Learning Outcome Model GLOSE. This framework helped museum libraries and artists to demonstrate the, the outcomes of the activities and the impact of the user learning experience. After this introduction to the Generic Learning Outcome Model, could you explain more about the aim of this tool and how important it would be for museums, libraries, and artists to assess the learning outcome of their activities? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it came out of a very specific um, time in, in the UK um, approach to museums and galleries. So, as I mentioned earlier, there was a report written by David Anderson, who was then working for the V&A, about how um, the learning potential of museums hadn't really been reached and there was a need for a much bigger sort of governmental push towards um, diversifying museums really and making them fit for learning in the 21st century really. Um, so I mean my history is a bit hazy around the exact um, timeline of events but generally there was a, um, a, a semi-governmental body set up called Resource, who were responsible for uh, museums, libraries and archives. Um, and they wanted to develop a toolkit that could support museums, libraries and archives in thinking about learning, um, thinking more widely about what learning was. And they specifically chose learning rather than education to try and get away from the whole formal education idea and have a much broader concept of what learning if these cultural organisations could mean. Um, and so they tasked um, a panel of experts, which included Professor Eileen Hooper-Greenhill, um, my colleague Jocelyn Dodd, and a team of other experts who thought about um, what learning in museums constituted, what would it look like, um, what would it, especially from the, um, the visitor's perspective, the user's perspective, um, and how could it be kind of condensed into a, a kind of a toolkit, a way that we could simplify it without losing the complexity of learning, but enable museums, libraries and archives to collect and capture evidence of that learning to use in their, um, using their programs to help them understand better, you know, their value for society. Um, and also it was a really important way of showing that museums need, you know, were important public goods that what they were doing had value. And a lot of this was to justify public funding. Um, so there was lots of reasons why it was happening. But going back to the toolkit itself. So, I mean, the idea was to develop a way of capturing learning. Um, so Eileen and her team of experts looked at a wide range of learning theories and using their own experiences of working for a long time in museums and galleries to think about what that learning would look like and how it could be captured. So they knew that it would need to capture learning across a wide range of organisations, as I say, it included libraries and archives as well, which are very different to museums, um, a wide, across a wide range of people from very young children to adults of diff lots of different ages, experiences and backgrounds as well. So it had to be something that people could understand um, from a wide range of backgrounds too. Um, and also the very key thing, as we talked about before, between informed and learning outcomes, the key difference was set that museums could not set learning outcomes for their visitors. It had to be articulated by or captured from the visitors themselves. So there was a lot about coming up with um, different evaluation methods, methods of research that would capture those learning outcomes. So it had to be useful for that as well. So it had to be very broad, but also capture specific instances of learning from those cultural organizations. So in the end, they came up with these five themes, which were both grounded in that learning theory, but also practical evidence of learning from across museums, libraries, libraries and archives. So the five key themes that they came up with in the end were knowledge and understanding, um, skills, enjoyment, inspiration, creativity, action, behaviour, progression, and attitudes and values. So the idea was that these five themes could capture 
the different types of learning that took place in museums, archives and libraries. And again, as I said before, it was implied that there would be a change. So there would be a change in your knowledge and understanding from going to a museum, you learn something new, or a change in a skill, um, or you know something as simple as enjoyment could also be captured. So there was a change in, you know, you might not have expected to enjoy your museum visit, that sort of thing. So it was capturing what visitors said about their experiences. Um, I came into the project when they piloted those five themes in museums, libraries and archives. Um, so I was the research assistant and we helped to develop evaluation methods that um, selected museums, archives and libraries could use to try and capture those uh, different types of learning outcomes and see if they worked as a general toolkit. Um, and the conclusion from the project was that they did work, um, that the five themes were broad enough to capture both um, a range of learning outcomes articulated by visitors, um, help to analyze and categorize as well, different types of ways that visitors describe their experiences. Um, and we also looked at different ways people could articulate their experiences. So I mentioned before children's drawings, that was a really interesting one um, that we tried out in several research projects. Um, interviews, um, questionnaires, and all sorts of diff different um, research methods. Um, and I think what was key from all of this, and this is something that museums, some museums really struggled with, it was the idea that we were capturing visitors' voices and responses to their visit, that it wasn't the museum saying, oh, I've got to capture experience, I've got to capture every single one of these themes in visitor responses. It was quite interesting that that's how a lot of museum workers saw that that's what they needed to do. We were like, no, it, you know, it doesn't matter if someone comes to a museum and only has an enjoyable experience, that still might lead to a change in their way of thinking about museums or way of thinking about themselves even. So it was just trying to get across that you didn't have to capture every single theme, um, but it was about just looking at what visitors said about their experiences really. Um, and I think some of the conclusions we also came to over years of working with the generic learning outcomes um, is that they, they can provide a very rich picture of the type of learning that takes place um, in a museum or a cultural organisation, but it really depends on the research methods used. I mean, obviously with um, surveys and um, sort of very um, quantitative um, research methods, I don't think they worked quite as well. Um, so trying to capture, you know, 20% of people said they learned a new skill. I think that was, that seemed a lot more reductive than using interviews and focus groups and more sort of dicursive methods of research, capturing what, how people talked about their learning. For me, that's where the GLOWs really came into their own because um, it really helped to understand, you know, what do we mean when someone changes their attitude towards something? What does that look like? And how might that um, change their life, for instance? And this is what museums always want to demonstrate, don't they? They want to demonstrate that people come in, they have this life-changing experience. And we did capture some of that. But again, as I say, it depends on the research methods that are used. And a lot of research methods, you know, they don't capture that um, impact on people's lives. It's just that snapshot of their visit to the museum, which is valuable in itself. But the, that was a key finding that, you know, if museums want to demonstrate their social and public impact, they have to, you know, use particular research methods and be serious about research. Um, and I think something else I learned through using the generic learning outcomes is that Obviously, learning is not the only reason to visit a museum, but by broadening your idea of what learning is to include enjoyment and inspiration, creativity, for instance. And again, that was quite controversial in some respects of being included as a learning outcome. But <coughs> sorry, um, I think 
the way in which learning is conceptualized through the glows is it's with one of its real strengths because it is so broad and you know obviously goes beyond um the idea of education as as having to learn specific things because you're relying on what visitors are talking about not you know a, a set curriculum or whatever sorry i'm losing my thread again um uh, and i think another key thing that i think the glaze helped to to kind of get museums into thinking about was that museums have a responsibility to be of value i think i think um often people think of museums as just being valuable by their very existence but i don't think that's that's true i think they need to show that they're of value and how they can show they're of value is by showing who they're reaching and what the people that they're reaching are getting out of that experience and then of course that raises questions about who aren't they reaching and why aren't they reaching those people and how can they reach them and how can they change their experience of the museum so that they are benefiting a much wider group of people um, and I think it also raises interesting questions about how museums present and interpret the objects that they have in their care. You know, how they do that is critical for our understanding of ourselves in a way. And I guess this is going to a wider view of what museums are for. I mean, I think museums are, are very, can be very important for helping us as humans to understand our place in the world, our place in society and history but also help us to think about where we might go in the future. And I think if museums have a responsibility to be of value, they need to communicate that to visitors and using the generic learning outcomes, I think is one way in which they can capture whether they're doing that. Um, so that, I mean, they're the main things I kind of got out of the generic learning outcomes project. And I know since then, there's been a lot of, debate in um, UK museums and probably across the world about you know what we need to capture and why and I think the glows have kind of um, they still have an influence um, a report done a few years ago for RCMG showed that many museum workers were still using them and thinking about them but they don't they certainly don't have as big a profile um, from the uh, government side anymore as they did. Um, so I'd be interested to see what their reach was now, to be fair. It's really good to see how the generic learning outcome model can be really useful for making an assessment of their contents. I think it can be useful for detailed content activities. So I would like to ask you about that. How can museums apply the generic learning outcome model on detailed activities and detailed content? So using the glows, you mean? Yeah. Um, see, I think for me personally, I think the glows help museums to understand if they're offering a broad learning opportunity for their visitors, because as I said, it was it's based on such a broad idea of learning. I think that's what it's they're useful for, um, as well as capturing information about how museums. I mean, how about, sorry, about how visitors engage with their museum. I think, as I was saying before, you know, if, if museums have this responsibility for learning and want to be a, a valuable space for learning, then I think, I still think using the GLOWS can help them achieve that. Um, because I still, personally, um, I don't think there's any other kind of toolkit that looks at learning in such... I don't I hesitate to use the word simple because it's not there's nothing simple behind the idea, but the way it's presented is you know the key five themes which have been tested in museums, libraries and archives, and they worked, and you know, most visitors were able to understand the concept of those themes as well. Um, and I think it goes it helps museums I think as well to see beyond the kind of um how should I say the sort of generic use of museums so how people 
go in you know how do people use the museum itself I think it helps museums to see beyond the specific oh they come in for 40 minutes and they look at this object and get them to think about well more what did they get out of that 40 minutes that they spent in the museum I think it it tries to avoid a more reductive view of what visiting is about and tries to look beyond that to see um you know the, uh, a more wider sense of who that person is where they're coming from and where the museum is taking them to um which i think is quite an interesting concept really and i think that for me has been has always been one of my frustrations with doing research into museums is that we kind of treat the visitor as an empty uh, an empty vessel you know we don't when they come in the museum they're just a museum visitor but they're not they're they're far much more than that they're a, a person with a history a background um and you know when we engage with them we don't always know where they're coming from and that's one of the and that's why i personally prefer interviewing <laughs> visitors in museums because you can get a much better sense from that of who that person is and from a questionnaire for example which is often done very rushed um, you've got very specific targets you want to achieve and you just again you, it's kind of reductive sorry <laughs> I totally agree with you I think it's really important as you say before people come from different backgrounds so it's important to check what they are interested in and how they move through the digital content. Also, it's crucial to check the learning outcomes of educational activities, not only museum exhibitions, as you are focused during the project, as we need to know the effectiveness and the engagement produced by the digital education resources on them. I know people from 18 to 30 year old, if they are not studying or interested directly in humanities, they don't connect easily with the content. So studying learning outcomes and promoting what they are going to learn on what they can do could be a way of engaging with them. That will be a way to go from the theoretical framework to a practical perspective as they require. That's right. I mean, I think that's the key, isn't it? It's, it's being able to use research and information that you collect about your visitors in a logical, well, in a practical way as well, improving, you know. Um, so not only understanding what you're providing at the time and how you can widen your audience to um, increase that. But yeah, but also, as you say, how you can improve that experience for others who, you know, who might not see the value unless it's, you know, written in a way that they understand. And that's why I think the language that you use to reach out to people is so important because that's kind of framing um, their experience of it already. See what I mean? Um, and I think that's one of the, going back to one of the values of the Glows is that the language was thought of very carefully, that it didn't, it didn't echo formal education, that it, it echoed more sort of informal learning language that was more open to um, experiences that a lot of people might not even see as learning. Um, and it's trying to kind of get people to understand that you know, museums are um, beyond formal learning in some ways, you know, they're, they're very different experiences. Um, but I do think it, it must be a challenge in terms of digital to, you know, understand your audience in a way. Um, well, we have talked about the relevance of learning outcomes from heritage education different similarities between formal and not formal learning outcomes, the ways of co-working between teachers and museum educators for developing more effective learning outcomes, and the relevance of making an assessment of these learning outcomes using the generic learning outcome model. To end this talk, I would like to talk with you about the, how the learning outcomes assessment model can be applied in a practical way. So could you tell the listeners which are your recommendations to implement the generic learning outcome model to get more effective higher education materials for young people? Well, I think it's going back to what you said before. It's, you know, working in a participatory way with communities and with audiences that you want to reach through your programmes. I think that's where the museum's got to start. Um, because I think one issue that always came up with the GLOWs was, 
as I said before, you know, museums thinking that they had to develop a programme that captured all those five generic learning outcomes. And I personally don't think that's what the point of them was. The point was not to use them in a very st structured way to get to hit those outcomes, because, again, that's going back to a more of a formal education um, approach. I think it's so for me, I think it's more about using the evidence that you already have or if you don't have the evidence collecting the evidence and then using that evidence to go back to the communities and talking to them about what they want to get um, from a, a program you know how as you said before you know often it's the teachers want specific things from museums and the museums aren't able to offer those so why not, you know, what can, how can museums and the, the teachers work better together to provide um, the programmes that, um, that are necessary or that are important for people? Um, and I guess it depends on what, um, what, what do communities want from museums? I mean, that's a, a, a massive question, isn't it? And um, and I think, again, it's going back to broadening people's perceptions of what's possible as well um, and trying to get beyond these sort of very fixed ideas about what museums are and what they can do and, you know, trying to trying to do new things. Those recommendations are really useful. I really thank you for sharing them with our audience. It will help them to work better in development and assessment of learning outcomes. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and know more about the relevance of learning outcomes for the development of heritage educational resources. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you. It's been very interesting, thank you. If you would like to learn more about learning outcomes in museums, libraries and narrative, I recommend you to read the report edited by Tiana Musuri, titled A Contest for the Development of Learning Outcomes in Museums, Libraries and Narratives, published in the framework of the Learning Impact Research Project team from the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries of the University of Leicester in the UK in 2002. To learn how to apply in a practical way the learning outcomes to educational activities, I suggest you to read the book edited by Pat Villeneuve and Anne Rose Love titled Visitor Centre, Exhibition and Educuration in Art Museums, published by Roman and Litfield Publishers in 2018. If you want to know European projects working on new teaching innovative methods, I recommend you to visit the Edmuse project website. The aim of this project is to promote new ways of learning and teaching through innovative methods using technologies and open digital resources that can be non-formal content for design curriculum. It's also proposed a new way for schools and museums cooperation. Another interesting project is the DICA project. The aim of the digital innovation in cultural and heritage education in the light of 21st century learning project DICA is to integrate digital resources and opportunities for cultural and heritage education in primary school. The partners of this project have developed a theoretical framework, some practical teaching scenarios and digital tools for the immediate use in the classroom based on heritage education. Thank you very much for being here today with Sir Jones and me in this podcast. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. Find all the resources from the topic we talk about in this podcast on the resource section of the Digital Education blog. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the project on social media. See you next week!